Today I'd like to talk about um, work uh, by a very large team um, where we're building the microscopes of tomorrow and I wanted in particular to thank my UCLA colleagues. They've been a real inspiration in this work in particular John. We've worked together for almost 20 years now um, and still discovering things with our with our groups and also my partner Henry Captain, Stan of course, Hong Zhao, Jose, uh, Laura Waller from Berkeley and, and the amazing younger scientists on the team, including uh, Kal Modiri, Min Fan and many others. They're, I'm just mentioning a few here at, um, at UCLA. And um, the, in my talk today, I'd like to talk about, of course, uh, microscopy is critical for many, many areas and emerging areas in science and technology all the way from nanophotonics to quantum technologies, um, pushing nanotechnologies, nanoelectronics, of course for vaccines, viruses, new 2D materials and better uh, and more energy efficient uh, thermoelectrics, batteries, just to, and that's just uh, to name but a few. Uh, and the challenges are only getting harder and harder. If you think about as we try to make uh, more energy efficient devices or a quantum device or pushing uh, the uh, semiconductor nodes to below two nanometers, uh, you have to be able to build um, and look at a near perfect interface. And that's something we can't do now. And you also need to be able to look at a functioning device if you really want to understand what is limiting that uh, performance or how the structure determines the efficiency or if we are to really understand uh, basic processes in cells uh, we don't have a microscope right now where you could take a living cell and image it and on all scale lengths and all time scales and so for that um, what we need to do um, is for example um, integrate measure uh, look at and integrate materials with near-perfect interfaces or a biomicroscope where you didn't have to kill the cell before you imaged it or you didn't have to put fluorescent proteins in it and maybe change its function. So uh, as part of this effort we're trying to make microscopes and develop methods that can see things better and see things as they happen and of course uh, as always, new tools in physicists are the tool builders and uh, new tools always give us uh, new insight into how things work. And uh, fortunately, um, every area of imaging, and this is what's wonderful to hear at the IPAM workshop today, every area of imaging is uh, undergoing amazing revolutions, which is why we've had many uh, Nobel Prizes in super resolution imaging and cryo microscopy in the past uh, um, 10 years or so. And uh, none of the s techniques to get to very high spatial resolutions, whether they're X-ray based or nano enhanced based or super resolution based, or electron-based microscopies, fortunately, given the <laughs> challenges we have, it, it's really good that none of them are anywhere near the physical or the quantum no noise limits. And this is really good. There's a, we have a long way to go and we have many challenges to address, so this is really good. Um, and no one imaging modality alone can solve all the problems. We really need to combine many modalities together. And John talked about that in his talk this morning, that fortunately we can use many of the same techniques to push many of these methods to their fundamental limits. And we need to solve many of the same problems um, in um, all of these uh, imaging methods. Okay, so. Uh, let's look at what do we want to look at and what spatial resolution do we need to be able to look at it. So of course we'd like to be able to look at, if we're doing microscopy, we'd like to be able to look at you know, cells, viruses, nanosystems, nano uh, nano-enhanced thermoelectrics and such. So we'd like to be able to move beyond the visible at a few microns or a fraction of a micron um, wavelength and uh, imaging resolution. Um, into the ultraviolet and x-ray region 
um, in uh, you know, angstrom to nanometer uh, resolution and be able to implement that in 3D and in real time. And that's something we can't do now. So um, even though it's, uh, th there's been so many uh, advances. And so for a light-based microscope, um, we can play tricks, but at, at a, you know, just a, at the simplest level, uh, the best spatial resolution you're going to be able to achieve is about half the wavelength that you use to illuminate your microscope with. And so that means if we want to get to um, nanometer to angstrom's intrinsic resolution without relying on prior knowledge and playing the amazing tricks that computational microscopy allows one to access, that then we need to use um, light in the extreme ultraviolet and x-ray region of the spectrum, and that's great. However, we are hindered by the fact that uh, normal materials don't refract short wavelength light. You have to make a diffractive optic, and there's no perfect diffractive optics. So at best, we can get 10 times the theoretical limit. On top of that, um, if you look at the amount of energy packed in every photon in the extreme UV or X-ray region of the spectrum. In the visible, um, we, if we just round up, we have an EV, one electron volt per photon in the, let's say, near-infrared region of the spectrum. By the time you get to the extreme UV or X-ray region of the spectrum, we're talking about 100 EV to a keV. And when that light is incident on the material, that will give rise to an electron with 100 to 1,000 times more energy than visible light. And so it is like a photon torpedo. Um, and it just will break bonds and completely um, turn biomaterial to the technical term is sort of mush. Um, and so uh, uh, and so if we look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the traditional microscopes and where we'd like to, to go, this is just a picture of a microscope you might find in, the, in your uh, high school um, science class or a simple electron microscope, you know, and, to, and if we look at tradi traditional microscopes, um, they look somewhat similar. Yeah, um, we illuminate the microscope with uh, essentially either a light bulb, the equivalent of a light bulb for light, or electrons. So in other words, the beam is not directed, so it's not like my laser pointer here, but rather a light that spreads out or electrons that spread out. Then they're incident on the sample, and then uh, a, a lens is used to recover the image, uh, both with light, in light microscopy or transmission electron microscopy or scanning electron microscopy. And uh, with uh, a resolution then limited by the optics that are used in the microscope. Um, and so if we look at the history of electron microscopy, um, Thompson discovered the electron in the late 1890s. Um, and just like light can have wave-like properties or particle-like properties, it, I, when it uh, is transmitted, it, it is transmitted as a wave exhibit and can exhibit constructive or destructive interference, but when it's either emitted or absorbed, it has a particle-like or photon-like properties. Uh, electrons have the same, and so um, in 20, 1924, de Broglie postulated that the electrons had a wave-like nature, and Dav Davison Germer uh, confirmed that in 23. Then in 1926, Bush developed the electromagnetic lens, and then in 1933, uh, Ruska built the first electron microscope with a spatial resolution better than one could achieve with a light-based microscope at the time. And then, of course, th this is where, I mean, there's you know, thousands of scientists and technologists working to actually take Ruska's electron microscope uh, to bring it to the amazing and powerful capability that's, you know, that they're present in every, you know, biochemistry and every material science, you know, department at the research active universities worldwide and also, of course, in, in, in uh, industrial R&D. So it's been just amazing. But, you know, for, especially for the youngsters in the audience, 
it's it's really humbling to to see how long that took you know so it took it took 50 years for uh, you know between when Ruska built the first electron microscope and, and it got the Nobel Prize but it's related to how long it took to take a technology from a demonstration to where it was really impacting other areas of science and you know that's um, that is often the case not in every case but it's very often the case and of course now um, you know uh, so uh, uh, you know there's powerhouse um, capability here just next door at CNSI. Uh, but there's a few things we'd like to do better. Uh, for example, the resolution in electron microscopes is truly amazing. Um, few angstrom level in cryo-electron microscopy and with John's um, atomic electron tomography techniques, you know, driving down to precisions of picometers or so. But if you're using 100 kV electron, that is 10 to the 5 times more energy in that electron torpedo than it is with visible light. And so to be able to um, not to have all the bonds broken in, one, in a delicate um, biological or soft material sample, um, one needs another approach, and of course the approach was cryo-electron microscopy. You know, freeze the sample so that the, uh, uh, the uh, constituents, the molecular co constituents, could not move. And that was a Nobel Prize in 2017. And of course, uh, for those of you following, it had, um, cryo-electron microscopy had a huge impact on imaging the COVID virus um, and uh, the uh, bioarchive uh, for the first time, the, biology, the biochemists would publish their paper immediately on bioarchives so they could try and help everybody else figure out some of the challenges associated with imaging COVID. And I want to give a shout out to Hong Zhao here at UCLA in biochemistry, um, who worked with Moderna for years um, uh, since uh, early 2020 um, in uh, imaging their vaccine. Uh, and then, of course, uh, electron microscopy can also solve long-standing ch challenges in materials and nanoscience. Um, this is work by uh, John and Hong in uh, imaging the, all the atomic positions in a nanoparticle, um, in a magnetic nanoparticle, to find out why um, the magnetic strength of the nanoparticle was not as strong as, as expected. And by doing that, he was able to show that each nanoparticle had many phases and only one of them was the phase that was supposed to be very strongly magnetic. And so it solved the problem for why the magnetic strength in these alloys was much uh, lower than people expected. And then um, uh, John talked this, mor this morning about using electron microscopy to determine the 3D structure of an amorphous material or glass and understanding, you know, how, you know, what the atomic arrangements were um, in detail, finding medium range orders that were not expected. And then this beautiful work by Hong in uh, uh, capturing the action of a molecular syringe. So I have a few movies to show you um, on this really gorgeous work on electron microscopy. So this is John's nanoparticle. Oh, sorry, the, uh, um, the, the nanoparticle of glass um, showing how one can extract the position of every single atom in this uh, glass. And then... is really beautiful. And then um, in this second movie, I'll play... Uh... To fight infection, doctors Can you hear that okay? Okay, great. Drugs that each kill a number of different microbes. These drugs have a downside though. Some bugs develop resistance that they can pass on to other bugs, making them even more dangerous. The drugs also can wipe out helpful microbes in the human gut. If antibiotics target specific species of microbes, they wouldn't have these disadvantages. Thanks to a collaboration led by faculty of the California Nanosystems Institute at UCLA, 
UCLA were what? Oops. Oh my I'm sorry. Okay, let me see if I can catch it again. UCLA were one step closer to that kind of advance in precision medicine. The researchers examined a naturally occurring nanomachine that kills bacteria, an R type of piacin. It's made and released by a bacterium called Pseudomonas aeruginosa to sabotage its microbial competition. The scientists revealed the piacin's atomic structure and described its mechanical action using leading edge technology from the UCLA Electron Imaging Center for Nanomachines at CNSI. The study portrays an elegantly simple and specific killing machine. Some details revealed in earlier research from the study's leaders. The piacin has a cylindrical trunk. An outer sheath surrounds an inner tube, the piacin's weapon. Below the trunk is a base plate with six tendrils. The piacin lands on a bacterial cell. The tendrils act as sensors. The new study provided previously unknown information about what happens next. When the tendrils bind to specific structures on the cell surface, the base plate splays out. This triggers the outer sheath to collapse, driving the inner tube down into the cell, killing it. This research feeds into bio-inspired engineering, technology that takes its design cues from nature. Understanding how the piston recognizes its prey and deals its killing blow could enable scientists to better mimic and even customize its action with the potential for antibiotics that are more specific, harder for microbes to gain resistance to, and gentler on patients' bodies. So th this is absolutely gorgeous work from Hong's lab. And of course, what we would really like is to have a microscope that could actually, that, you know, capture that simulation in action. We could learn so much if we could do that. So just a brief history of X-ray microscopy, which really followed um, a very parallel timeline to electron microscopy. So Ronkin discovered X-rays in, again in the late 1890s as, um, uh, and uh, in 1912, Bragg's develop, Bra the Braggs developed X-ray crystallography. And then in 1948, uh, Kirkpatrick and Baez made the first X-ray microscope um, using their famous uh, KB uh, focusing optics. And for the young people in the audience, um, uh, Baez has another claim to fame. He was Joan Baez's, Baez's father. Um, and then, of course, Franklin and, and co-workers in 1951 used X-ray diffraction to uncover the double helix structure of DNA. And then in 1999, uh, Miao, John Miao and David Sayer demonstrated the first coherent diffract diffraction imaging or lensless imaging. So uh, why, was it, why is this important and why, why do we want to use diffractive or computational imaging to go beyond the limits of x-ray imaging? Well, um, if, you, if you think about uh, looking at an x-ray in your doctor's or dentist's office, uh, it doesn't matter that the wavelength is well below an angstrom. We heard many talks today where the illumination wavelength was um, well below a nanometer to an angstrom and even shorter. The problem is because of the challenges of just not having a perfect lens and essentially making a microscope with an X-ray light bulb, um, the spatial resolution is limited to you know, an order of 10 nanometers or higher. So we can't access the wavelength level resolution that's theoretically po po possible using X-rays as the illumination. Uh, and so that's where Strobe and my colleagues and members are trying to um, take the hardware toolbox associated with uh, X-ray and nano and electron imaging and then combine them with a computational toolbox so we can go beyond the limits of traditional um, imaging. And uh, the types of problems we're ta trying to tackle are, for, for example, imaging the vaccines and viruses, but also understanding um, functional properties and materials. And this turns out to be quite important whether we're looking at 
Um, you might think it's an old topic of heat transport. You would think we would know everything about heat transport, but it turns out we don't because it's fundamentally a dynamic phenomena and engineers and material scientists have been looking at it with visible light, like the laser pointer I'm using here. And if you try to look at something that's a very small scale with visible light, the only way you can do that is if you have an accurate model so you can actually simulate and interpret what you're seeing. And then we have a chicken and egg situation because if you can't see directly, you have no way to test if your model is right. And that essentially has been the situation in many nanoscale functional properties um, because we have the beautiful static images from electron microscopy. We have dynamic images from visible light but if you can't see the nanoscale function, then you can't build the, the right models. And so let me give you a couple of examples with that. So then to address this problem, um, then we have to move from incoherent imaging, where we're limited by the lossy and imperfect optics, where our resolution is at least 10 times um, what the, uh, the wavelength or 10 times the theoretical resolution and that we still essentially this is you know the first image Ronkin took of his um, wife's hand and you know if you look at the images in your doctor's or dentist's office they, they don't really look a whole lot better and that's because essentially it's the same technology and so then to kind of you know be able to make another step then the idea is okay let's harness coherence Let's use the fact that in the last, um, let's say, 15 years or so, we have practical sources of directed beams of short wavelength light. And now we can image with a laser-like beam instead of a light bulb. And essentially, that is allowing us to get to, um, the, to enhance the spatial resolution to now below the wavelength of the illuminating X-ray beam. So how does it work? Well, let me see if I can show you. So um, now, uh, so we already, so, so here we're going to use coherence and coherence is related to phase. And we've known this since we were all kids because when we see um, the colors of oil on, a, on water or in a, when we're blowing bubbles, the color that, um, that you see is related to the thickness of the oil film, for, for example. So um, having um, information about a sample encoded by what we call the wavelength or the phase is not new. And we can actually show that if we have laser-like or coherent illumination, that we should be able to get some information about the sample. And this is a little, um, the physics education research team at CU Boulder has some wonderful um, applets in uh, physics, chemistry, biology, um, earth and environment. This is one of them. And so the idea is we can do, um, we can do fast experiments and check. So if we illuminate different targets, what will the scatter pattern look like? So this is the experiment. We're going to turn on our laser. We can change the color and then look at the scatter pattern. And I know you're all experts, so um, you can easily um, predict that if I decrease the diameter, I'm going to um, fill the whole aperture of detection. As I increase the diameter, my scatter pattern will change uh, accordingly. If we ch take a different um, uh, sample size and geometry, it will we'll get a beautiful diffraction pattern corresponding to um, a square hole, and if I mix circles and holes, I can uh, uh, have uh, signatures of both, and I can make one more prominent than another, but we can certainly see this diffraction pattern. This, these are very simple structures, of course, and, um, and so we can easily see the signature of the circle and hole, and then as I get um, arrays of holes, then I, you, we can see uh, essentially uh, we can, uh, we can simulate a crystal and the diffraction. And then as I make my circles bigger, 
we get these uh, again beautiful diffraction patterns but as one introduces disorder you can see it's going to be more difficult to extract a one-one relationship between the scattered light and the object and if the object is complex that has different materials then suddenly that becomes just non-intuitive and so one needs help um, and then the, the the last image I'll show is of the stick girl John you might remember this one we, we, we published in a in an article in 2019 so Ariel, who's now the graduate student at the time, is now working with these um, physics simulations. So he did this where we can actually rotate the girl and watch the diffraction pattern uh, change. And you can see this diffraction pattern as you would, many people in the audience are experts in this. You can see there's a double slit, there's a circle, and you can see all of that um, diffraction patterns encoded. Great, okay, so essentially, um, instead of recognizing patterns uh, in coherent diffraction imaging, and as uh, John uh, showed in the famous 1999 paper, if we il uh, illuminate a sample with a coherent uh, beam of X-ray light, well-defined phase, we can collect the scatter pattern like we saw in the simulation, collect it on the detector that is only sensitive to the intensity. But given that the sample can be complex and so different parts of the beam go through different thicknesses, different materials and such, different parts of the beam will have a different phase. So we can't simply take a Fourier transform to recover the object. So there we need help from a phase retrieval algorithm. Um, uh, this sort of general approach but with no detail was proposed by David Sayre back in 1952 and I always thought it was so beautiful that David was a co-author with John uh, over 50 years later in the first experimental demonstration and that's because it took that long for synchrotrons to be bright enough that you could put an aperture in the beam and actually make that beam coherent but the thing that I often sort of sigh with great um, sadness about is that this was um, Sayer's full 1952 paper and on top of that um, if you look at look at the last line of the paper the extension to three dimensions is obvious <laughs> <laughs> who nowadays could ever get away with writing that at the end of our papers <laughs> you know the referees are way harder now <laughs> anyway so so why is this so uh, such a beautiful technique um, it's because there is no optics between your sample and the detector so that means there's no aberrations there's no loss so that means you can get the theoretical resolution if your sample of course is highly scattering it has a scatter light um, but you can always sort of help it by putting in reference samples or nanoparticles into the sample um, you, uh, there's lots of good things about um, extra imaging uh, you get not only the intensity or the amount of light that gets scattered through but it gives the phase retrieval retrieves the phase and often that is even more sensitive to the structure of the material than the actual transmission. And the other two great um, aspects of this coherent diffraction imaging is that uh, normally in a microscope you have to worry about keeping that sample stable to the resolution you're trying to achieve. Here you just have to keep the sample stable enough. It's still hard, but just stable enough that the light does not move on the detector pixel. And the tech detector pixels can be, let's say, you know, 10 microns. So it, in terms of um, being robust to vibrations, you still can't be sloppy, but it is a really nice imaging technique. You don't need a $10 million lab to just house the microscope. You can just take reasonable cautions. And particularly for low-dose samples, since there's no, nothing between the sample and the detector, one can really image with um, 
a low number of photons and, and those techniques are getting better and better all the time. So to kind of give a very, this is a very crude and initial um, example of, of an algorithm. There are much, much better algorithms available now, but you could think about this was the first experiment uh, we did with John where we just, the students uh, cut a very crude J for Jilla in a, just a simple, you know, transmission J. You take the diffraction pattern, um, then in this initial work, we had to apply a constraint. Nowadays, we don't have to, but the constraint was you knew the J was in a finite region, so you, the first guess is to just um, put arbitrary phases and take an inverse transform. But then if you had any object outside the region you knew your object was, you could just set those um, pixels to zero because you had that prior information, take another Fourier transform, and then replace the retrieved intensities with the experimental intensities and then go around the loop and uh, hopefully converge. But these uh, initial algorithms were not that powerful. So you couldn't um, necessarily believe if you ran the algorithms multiple times, uh, one might get a different answer depending on what was looking what, what, in the initial conditions. But um, it, the, re, being able to retrieve this phase is still extremely powerful. Um, this is a different version of the example John gave this morning, that if we take an amplitude object, so we take the bunny and we make a Fourier transform and then separate the amplitude and phase, and then you would think the most important thing would be the scattered light. Um, and, but if you actually throw away the phase and take that scattered light and uh, throw away the phase, I mean, we, we were just going to set the phase to be constant across the whole image and then take an inverse transform. Then it is hard to recognize this retrieved object as a bunny. You might think there's ears somewhere, but it's a very abstract bunny. Um, and so now instead, if we throw away the amplitude and keep the phase and then do a Fourier transform, then we get uh, the bunny to within the, the this, uh, um, uh, the, the orientation, uh, which we can use other tricks to solve this. So it's a, a really amazing technique and one of the techniques that made the reliability of the phase retrieval algorithms even better was to take a lot of redundant data. So this is an example of a laser beam um, over a little, moving over a circuit where the adjacent positions have significant overlap and that means that the algorithm has a lot of redundant data and that helps be much more confident in the um, images that are retrieved. And so essentially we used to say X-ray imaging is undergoing a revolution but I think now we can say that X-ray imaging has undergone a revolution and every synchrotron source, every tabletop coherent light source, every x source now has this capability to implement um, this uh, lensless imaging and what it's enabling is at the first uh, near-perfect x-ray microscopes. So what's shown um, here on the left are the types of things we can do with tabletop coherent short wavelength light sources and on the right here is work that was done by Chris Jacob Jacobson and John Miao at the APS and then with David Shapiro and, and John and a bunch of us um, at the uh, Advanced Light Source Cosmic Im Imaging Facility. And so essentially um, can get to the sub-wavelength sub EUV imaging and, and extract very interesting new understanding of transport phenomena in all kinds of systems, in magnetic systems, in, in um, semiconductor systems, uh, in photovoltaic and battery systems. And just as one example, right now in the semiconductor industry, for example, if they have a, a nanosystem, one way they can um, really look at it with very high spatial and compositional resolution is to take it out, cut a small piece, put it into an electron microscope, and you get superb imaging, but you have to destroy the sample. So what a bunch of our students did, Michael Tangsavala and Yuka Sashi and Nick Jenkins, was to make, for us, this is quite a complex microscope um, where um, uh, it's a reflection mode microscope where they, and the reason why this works very well is in the extreme UV region of the spectrum, you get to light 
that's a hundred times shorter wavelength than visible light, but it's not in the x-ray region, so it can still reflect off a sample. So you can stick a piece of semiconductor in, into the uh, microscope and still get enough reflection and then use these um, uh, amazing phase retrieval algorithms and a lot of other things then to make a both a spatially resolved and a depth resolved map of this uh, semiconductor sample. And of course here, you know, people want to know, you know, what the doping levels are, are things aligned, what are the um, interfaces like and such. And so this is the first step towards being able to do that, where this is um, reconstructed, this um, a spatially resolved map, and here is, this is a log of the atomic ratio, this is a log scale as a function of depth into the um, semiconductor where one can see the carbon contamination, the oxide layers, the structures, um, again, interfacial layers, and then some dopants um, on the silicon itself. Um, and for this, uh, we were able to, uh, we, were, uh, we worked with um, EMEC, which is a semiconductor, one, one of the largest semiconductor R&D facilities, and also with uh, UCLA and others. And then very recently, um, two of our students, uh, Nathan Brooks and Ben Wang, uh, uh, tackled a problem that has, it, it's a long-standing problem in coherent diffraction imaging, which is how do you make a high-quality um, image of a very highly periodic sample? And so the sample was just a simple carbon uh, mesh on a TEM grid. And uh, so this is uh, an image of that. And normally, if we just put that into a, uh, one of our um, usual uh, current diffraction microscopes and uh, do an, uh, make an image of it, then the scatter patterns as we move the beam on the sample all look the same. So there's no, as we heard earlier, there's no diversity in the scatter patterns. And so when the phase retrieval algorithm retrieves an image of the sample, instead of getting the nice 20 nanometer thick carbon mesh, it, it extracts a very nice charton pattern that might be very good for a kilt, but the problem is it's not the sample. And, and so uh, what uh, Nathan and Bin figured out is if they change the divergence of which, at which they illuminate the sample, they can force the scatter pattern the different orders in the scatter pattern to interfere. And now when you move the beam over the sample, you get a big change in diffraction in the scatter patterns as you move the beam around. And suddenly you get extremely rapid and high, high quality uh, convergence for periodic samples. So um, uh, I, I'll say more about this on, 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 on Thursday and, and explain more about what's going on. But the other neat thing about it is that why, we want to, why would you want to make an image of a periodic structure? You can just do a, uh, you know, a diffraction or sort of scattering of it and so to get the dimensions you don't need to do a full image. What you need a full image for is to see if there's defects. So we had seen on the little grid that there was one part of the 20 nanometer thick carbon ribbon that had a scratch. So some, it had accidentally gotten some things removed so then we wanted to do correlative imaging, so we stuck it in an SEM, or a scanning electron microscope. But as they scanned over the region with the defect, what they noticed is that the scanning electron microscope was milling the line away. <laughs> so it was changing the sample as we imaged it. Um, and CD, the, the CDI did not, because of course there's a, about a factor of 100 or more difference in the energy of the particles you're bombarding the delicate sample with between the um, uh, EUV. This was a, I think we, we were using a um, 25 EV photon energy here. So we weren't trying to push the spatial resolution. Here we were trying to develop a technique that would work to be able to image periodic samples. Okay, so in the last part of my talk, how am I doing time-wise? Am I, am I doing okay? 
six minutes or so. Perfect. That's perfect. Yep. Yep. Last part of my talk, I'd like to just uh, talk about um, this um, sort of challenge of understanding heat flow. Uh, it's pretty important. We waste seventy percent of the energy in the U.S. has lost us heat. Um, we all know that um, our iPhones and our laptops, um, all, a lot of the energy and battery energy is being used there, um, is being lost there as heat. And um, but we also know that if you nanostructure, then one can. Uh, make much better thermoelectrics, for example. You can have a factor of 10 to the 4 reduction in thermal conductivity um, if you, while still maintaining electrical conductivity. So there's energy in many areas, in nanoelectronics, quantum, thermoelectrics, you want to be able to control the transport and the temperature because if it's a Josephson junction, for example, the efficiency of the device, you know, it determines its it, the temperature will determine the efficiency and performance. Um, but there is no complete model of nanoscale phonon transport in um, in any sort of nanostructured, whether it's a hotspot, whether it's a nanostructured material. So the fundamental physics codes are too computationally intensive to model a real device. And the phenomenological models that engineers use are based on visible measurements. So there's a, just a, a, a very big gap between any sort of predictive um, ability to say, what, you know, to, to, to actually design a layout properly. So what do we do? So we um, we can sort of simulate a transistor by putting an array of transducers on the surface and then zapping them with the femtosecond laser. And this is a simulation that's way over exaggerated. These are tiny nanostructures and then we can use shortwave and light then to do a stroboscopic movie um, of the sample and we can look at that thermal expansion and then heat loss into the substrate. Uh, we can look at that with picometer resolution because we're using short wavelength light so we can measure the phase to a fraction of the wavelength. So we're not doing anything different than what one does with visible scatterometry but using a much shorter wavelength light so we can look at smaller structures and features. And it was quite amazing what we discovered the first time the students came and told us this we were all said it couldn't possibly be true and then we and that's what the engineers said at the MRS meeting too, it couldn't possibly be true. And then two years later they said, okay, we, we can see we have visible light, so it might be true, but so what am I talking about? Might be true or might not be true. So the, um, if we think about uh, heat flow in, in macroscopic scales, if you want to cool something hot, you would pack it and surround it with cold material. So it turns out the nanoscale, that that's not true. Um, at the nanoscale, you want to put your hot spots close together because what you want to do is you want phonons from adjacent nanostructures to interact because that will establish a temperature and a gradient and drive the heat away. And if you don't do that, what you get is this sort of channeling where in the macro scale, all the material around a hot spot would get hot. But at the nanoscale, there's cold regions adjacent to very hot material. We now understand, like seven years later, working with theorists in Barcelona and in aerospace engineering, we now understand some of, not all, everything, but some of the um, things that are going on. The lattice vibrations are scattering. We, we can, the, na the nanostructuring enhances scattering in plane and then that drives cross plane, but there's, um, we can sort of see similar generalizations in nanowires, nanomeshes, the nanostructured thermoelectrics, um, and there, while we can sort of see the general behavior and see it's the same for all the different nanostructured semiconductors, there still is no fully um, fundamental understanding. Whereas we do understand for nanoscale hotspots, we sort of now are now just beginning to build a picture of what's actually going on. And just to, again, it's one of these uh, sort of time scales comments that uh, the light sources we're using um, on the tabletop scale, um, it took 35 years for them to be 
adapted for a real world um, R&D. And one of the things people want to figure out is for the most advanced chips, they moved from ultraviolet lasers to uh, pattern the uh, photoresists to extreme UV lasers. Um, that it took 30 years to do that. Um, the initial R&D um, that was done um, in this area at El Biennale, and Chris will remember this, uh, it, it was done when it started when, when I was a grad student, which is like shock for any of you know, the younger people. So it, was, it took 30 years to get this technology, but you can see that while if you move from an ultraviolet laser to uh, um, at around uh, you know, 6 EV or something to a 100 EV photon, so you're shrinking down the wavelength you're using to pattern or resist, you're getting, the line is getting thinner, but the edge is getting very rough. And uh, what um, the uh, folks developing these resists um, found is that, that their models did not predict it was going to be this rough. So the fundamental understanding of how a photon interacts with the photoresist, how the photoresist is exposed, is, is just uh, incorrect. So now they're trying to do more research to figure out how to develop better resists that would give them cleaner edges and such. It's a really fundamental materials chemistry issue, how uh, high energy photons are absorbed by um, in chemicals. And then this, this just shows the just a, a picture of the scale length of the technology we use in our lab. So this is the femtosecond laser, this is the light source, and then these are the little, um, we call them beam lines, but they're, they're tabletop beam lines. This is the lab at IMEC that's being used to you know, develop resists and imaging and um, understanding, um, uh, developing new materials and, and such. And these systems are now also being used by NIST. And John talked about this beautiful work in imaging magnetic textures. Um, uh, uh, he, he was talked about hedgehogs and anti-hedgehogs with the uh, spin textures akin to the, the spine texture in the hedgehog. Um, given that I have, I'm almost out of time, I'll just, um, just acknowledge it, this was a huge effort with a very large group of people all the way from theorists who never thought anybody would ever be able to image the uh, texture they were predicting in a material. In fact, the, the postdoc at the time, who was the postdoc at the time, who made this prediction of this hedgehog structure, he said they didn't even bother trying to calculate it perfectly because they never thought anybody would be able to measure it. But then with John and Stan and a bunch of people, Arjun and just a bunch of people, um, able to make this beautiful movie of what the spin texture inside a nanostructured metal lattice looks like. Um, and John showed this movie uh, this morning, but it's just uh, absolutely stunning. And of course, what we'd love to be able to do is to perturb this texture and then capture the changing texture and how fast that um, changing texture propagated. So, even though we have beautiful microscopes now, we still, we still have many more new types of microscopes we want to develop. So I hope I've given you just a flavor that uh, we still need microscopes and methods that can see better and see things as they happen, but we're making progress just by working together along the same, with the same philosophy as IPAM in actually realizing that we need mathematics, material science, engineers, and physicists and chemists um, all working together to actually tackle any of these hard problems. And, uh, and I know m many of my colleagues have been in this field for decades, and it is not a field for the faint-hearted. So this is a um, picture of the first uh, commercial NMR spectrometer, and that was 40 years after um, uh, NMR was observed as a new phenomena, and uh, and then on this little um, sign here, uh, it, they have um, this machine is subject to breakdowns during periods of critical needs. There's a special circuit called the crisis detector. It senses the poor grad student's emotional state in terms of how desperate she, he or she is to use the machine. 
It then creates a malfunction proportional to the desperation and threatening the machine with violence only aggravates the situation. So, in other words, and I think this is just a, a, a perfect thing for the microscopes that we, we all talked about today and such. This is, and, and not to mind the computational um, uh, algorithms. Um, so with that, I'd like to end by thanking IPAM, the Green family, uh, the colleagues that we've worked with, and of course the funders, and thank you so much for your attention.